thought this book was about me. Don't they know my time on Earth is running out? I've got to get to Camp Half-Blood and face the last surviving members of the Triumvirate. <coughs> and somehow, if I manage to survive that, I have to face my nemesis Python. Why, Father, you're torturing me so! Hey everybody, this is Rick Riordan, and I'm here tonight with Books of Wonder from New York City. We hope you guys enjoy the evening. Yay! Welcome everybody. I am so happy to be here with the eight-day virtual tour for the Tower of Nero. We are going all around the U.S., and we're not even leaving our houses, but we're going to have a lot of fun. And we've got special guest appearances at every event different guest stars, and I'll tell you about that in a second. So the Tower of Nero, where are we going? We are virtually visiting Brookline Booksmith in my hometown of Boston. We're going to New York City for the Books of Wonder, Politics and Prose in D.C., Little Shop of Stories in Decatur, Georgia, Blue Willow Bookshop in Houston, Barnes & Noble, Kepler's in Menlo Park, California, and books a million. Whew, I'm tired just thinking about it. Let's get started. So what's the book about? The Tower of Nero features our old friend Apollo, god of music, god of poetry, god of medicine, god of archery, and all around just super duper dude. Unfortunately, as you may know, if you've been following the series, Apollo is not exactly Apollo these days. No, Apollo is Lester Papadopoulos. Poor teenage Lester who has really no skills, no redeeming features at all, and he's sent down to Earth by his father Zeus. He is grounded and forced to become a mortal kid and somehow find his way back to earning his godhood on Mount Olympus. Well, so how's he doing with this quest? Eh, I mean, I guess he's made some progress over the last four books. He's gone all over the place. He's seen a lot of stuff, but unfortunately, he's still got a big couple of enemies that he's got to fight, and he's got to really determine what is it going to take to be Apollo again. And when he does, if he does turn into Apollo again, what is that even going to look like? Here's a look at all the places we have been in the world. We started, as you might remember, back in the Hidden Oracle in Manhattan. That's where he fell to earth, went to Percy Jackson's house for help. Percy was really totally psyched to be asked to do yet another quest. But we got him to Camp Half-Blood, and then we sent him on his way. From there, Lester went to Indianapolis, where he met some friends at the way station. He went down to Palm Springs and then Santa Monica. Oh, some bad stuff happened in Santa Monica. I can't talk about it. But then from there, he went to Camp Jupiter in the Bay Area. And now he's heading back to the East Coast to face one final great ordeal. So what do you have to look forward to? Well, you're going to see Meg McCaffrey again, that's for sure. Our friend Meg, as you know, is the daughter of Demeter. She is really great with fruit, vegetables, flowering vines, and she's not too shabby dual-wielding scimitars either. So it's a good thing that Lester slash Apollo has her on his side. However, there's another couple that is going to be pretty big in this book, and I am pretty sure a lot of you will be happy to hear that Will and Nico, campers extraordinaire at Camp half -Bud, are back, and they have a big role to play in this. Now, I love this artwork. This is Viria artwork. I'm not sure why it, it, it's like Nico looks like he's a foot shorter than Will. I don't think that's actually accurate, but that's okay. That's okay. They, 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 look, they look great. And Rachel Elizabeth Dare, our friend, the Oracle of Delphi. Now, Rachel hasn't been able to do many prophecies because Python, the great serpent, has taken over Delphi itself. 
So she's been kind of cut off from the future. Is she going to get back her ability? That depends on Apollo. So we'll see what happens, but Rachel is along for this adventure, and she's got a big part to play. Is she going to hit anybody with her blue plastic hairbrush? Wait and see. So what's the quest? Well, as you know, it's already cost us quite a bit. Jason Grace, spoiler alert, yeah, I can't even make myself say it, but we said goodbye to a dear friend in the Trials of Apollo, and it really, really hurt. Nevertheless, this is sometimes what happens. Dare I say, it's usually what happens when you're a demigod. Just like Percy Jackson warned you in The Lightning Thief on page one, most of the time, you end up dying in painful, nasty ways. I wish that wasn't true, but we're going to make it count, though. Jason, my man, to you. Here are some of the many things that have tried to kill Lester so far in the Trials of Apollo. You would think that after a while, I'd run out of Greek monsters to talk about, but that never seems to be the case. There's so much in Greek mythology that the more you get into it, the more you find. So see, these are just some of the wild, wacky kind of things that we've already faced. We've got Pandos. Oh, that's another painful memory, our poor Pandos friend. We've got the Troglodytes. Yeah, I love the Troglodytes. You're going to meet them in this book. And all of the rest, they're coming your way in the Tower of Nero. And, of course, Nero himself is coming your way. Oh, this guy. I mean, you thought Caligula was bad. You thought Commodus was vain and narcissistic. Take both of them and blend them together and multiply that nastiness by 10, and you've got Nero. This guy, I don't even know. And he's Meg McCaffrey's sort of stepfather, too. So that makes things really complicated. He's this sort of emotionally abusive foster father to her, and Meg has been dealing with this for her whole life. Now she's got to go back after all her adventures with Lester and try to make sense out of who she is, what does it mean to be in a family, and can she face this horrible, horrible father figure? Where is she going to land in this? Whose side is she on? That is another thing that remains to be seen in book five. I wish I could tell you that Nero is the only big bad that you're going to have to see in the Tower of Nero. Unfortunately, there's another big bad that Apollo will have to face, his old arch nemesis, Python. Now, Python is a lot more than just a big snake. He was the original owner of the caverns of Delphi. He has now taken them back, and Apollo will have to fight him. Now, Apollo has defeated Python before. That's how he got Delphi. The only thing was, the first time, Apollo was an actual god with, like, powers and stuff. Now, he's Lester Papadopoulos with not so much of the powers. Is he going to be able to face his old enemy and somehow defeat him and take back Delphi? He's always known through the Trials of Apollo, this is the biggest, baddest, most difficult challenge he's going to have to face. And this is the book where we find out, does Lester have what it takes? Wow. Five books in The Trials of Apollo. It is hard to believe that I've been telling this many stories for this many years about a god who, at the beginning anyway, really wasn't a very sympathetic character. I mean, let's be honest, Apollo, he's kind of full of himself. He really thought he was hot stuff. No pun intended, but yeah, he does drive the sun. So, as he's gone through the series... I've really started to feel some more sympathy for him. He's been through a lot. I think being human has taught him a lot. He's learned what it is to lose someone. 
he's learned what it is to be really faithful and loyal to your friends. Not everything comes easy when you're a demigod or when you're a human. And Apollo, I think, has a new appreciation for that. The question still is, has he learned enough from all the demigods that he's met? All of these heroes we know from Percy Jackson's world, has he really learned how to be a hero? Because it takes a lot more than just power and immortality to really rise and be like Percy Jackson or one of the other demigod heroes. If you haven't heard yet, it's pretty cool and exciting stuff. Uh, the background on this, uh, as you may know, the Percy Jackson series was adapted into two movies. Uh, this was, what, 10 years ago now. I was not really involved in those. Uh, I tried to sort of give my two cents, and, and I read the scripts and gave some notes, like lots and lots of notes. But, you know, it became pretty clear pretty early that they were interested in doing their own thing. And it was not going to be what I would consider a faithful adaptation. So after I read the scripts, I just kind of sat back and I said, look, guys, you know, if this is the way it's going, I'm out. I, I really can't, I can't do this. Um, and really, that was my only option. I mean, I didn't have any control back then. I had no power as an author. Uh, you know, basically, the studio was calling all the shots. And that's the, that's the way it is really most of the time mostly when an author adapts a book. So we sat with that for years and years. There wasn't much we could do. And then uh, the industry kind of got a shake up. Fox, who had the Percy Jackson rights, got bought by Disney. Disney is my publisher. And I started thinking, hmm, this is interesting. I wonder if we can sort of shake things up, shake things loose. So a year ago, I started going out to Hollywood in person and having meetings. And boy, did we have a lot of meetings. I talked to everybody. I tried to explain what had happened the first time around, why my readers didn't like it, why I couldn't let that happen again, why I really wanted to make a better adaptation. But after much, much hard work, we finally, finally got an agreement that we are going to produce not more movies, but a TV show based on Percy Jackson. This is going to be done to stream on Disney Plus, which was my idea. I liked this idea. I said, yes, this is the way to do it. We're going to take the five books of Percy Jackson. We're going to turn each book into one season. That will give us time to really do it right and make each episode the best it can possibly be. So where are we now? We have a team together. I am on that team. I'm not the only voice, but uh, Becky, my wife, and I, who have always been a team behind the books, she's always my best advisor. We are on board. We're part of the process. We have a say. We're at the table. And we can say, look, guys, this is you know, not what Percy, Percy would do, or this is not like it is in the book. It's too much of a change. Now, obviously, some things are going to have to change. Movies and TV, they're just not the same as books. You have to show some things a little bit differently. And you can't just go page by page and scene by scene. You do have to have a little bit of flexibility. Also, we kind of want to make it fresh for people that have never read the books and people that have read the books 20 times. You know, if you think you know the story, there still needs to be something new and interesting for you, a reason for you to watch this adaptation. I think we're on the right track. Keep your fingers crossed, still early days, but I'm really excited that we finally seem to be having something in process for you guys. So I will keep you uh, updated on that, but right now I feel real good about it. Oh yeah, and what else have I been doing in my spare time when I haven't been writing novels and I haven't been making trips out to Hollywood and working on the TV show? I've also been getting a master's degree in Gaelic literature at the University College Cork in Ireland. Now, I did this all online. Why would I do this? For one thing, I've always loved mythology, but the one 
sort of mythology I felt like I, I, I could speak to and I haven't yet is Celtic mythology, Celtic mythology, in particular Irish mythology. Uh, that's my ancestry. In fact, my ancestors came from Cork City, and they lived like right down the street from this college. That's the, the main building of UCC. So I thought it was a cool idea to get a degree from that university in Gaelic literature. So I started learning Irish. I started reading the ancient manuscripts of Irish mythology, what we have of it anyway, the, uh, the folk tales, everything that I could get my hands on. Some of this I knew, but I can tell you now I know it a lot better. I finished my thesis. Uh, it's on the god Lug, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, but now I really feel like I'm in a place where I can speak to Irish mythology. And yes, absolutely, the end goal of this is to use that material in children's books, the way I have with Greek and Roman mythology, the way I have with um, Egyptian and Norse mythology. I feel really close to Irish mythology. I am not Irish myself, uh, but it is my ancestral heritage. I'm not going to tell it the same way an Irish author would. There are many great Irish authors that are doing that. But I do think I have something to contribute, and it's been a lot of fun so far to get into that. But of course, my favorite thing to talk about is not my books, but it's the imprint Rick Riordan presents. This has been incredibly fun for me to do. I have gotten so, so much satisfaction because I don't get the credit for this. I don't get the money for this. This is all about me getting to book talk other fantastic authors and promoting their books. And if you haven't heard where Rick Riordan Presents came from, basically, a few years back, I was talking to my editor at Disney, and she said, Rick, would you ever be uh, interested in the idea of doing your own imprint? An imprint is, is kind of a subdivision, a, a brand under the Disney publishing umbrella. And so I thought, you know, I, I've always gotten questions like, Rick, would you do a book on Chinese mythology, or would you do Aztec mythology, or West African mythology? And all of these great cultural stories are fantastic, but they're not my background, and they're not something I'm an expert at. So I thought to myself, wouldn't it be better if I could, rather than doing those stories myself, find authors from those backgrounds, um, marginalized groups that, that know these stories, that, that grew up with these stories, and could tell them from the inside with a real understanding and depth that I, I can't master. So we started looking for own voices authors to tell these stories in the same kind of way that I do with Percy Jackson. So they don't, I don't tell them what to write. Uh, they don't like model it after Percy Jackson, but we do look for things that are page turners, that have a good sense of humor, that deal with folklore or mythology in some way, and that I think my readers will like. So with each of these books, with all of these authors, I'm able to say, guys, I didn't write this book, but if you like my books, I am pretty sure you're going to love this too. And boy, have I been happy. I have uh, so far, I mean, I don't even, I can't even pick a favorite. They're all so amazing. We have just in the first couple of years, 1.5 million copies of these books in print. They have received a total of 28 starred reviews from various literary journals. This is not normal, guys. Most imprints do not get this kind of reception, and it's because we have such fantastic authors doing great stories. We have the Arush Shah series from Rosh Chakshi. Man, it is so good. There are going to be five in this series. Three are out already. And these have been optioned for TV and film by Paramount. We have the New York Times bestselling series, The Storm Runner, which deals with Mesoamerican mythology from J.C. Cervantes. It's been optioned for TV film by Apple. Another fantastic series. We have the New York Times bestseller Dragon Pearl by science fiction writer Yoon Ha Lee, recently won the Locust Award 
and it is such a fantastic mix of Korean mythology and science fiction. I, it's like nothing you've ever read. We have Carlos Hernandez, who wrote the Sal and Gabby duology, Break the Universe and Fix the Universe, that won the Pura Belpre Award and has been optioned by the Disney Channel. Kwame Mbaldia, whose bestseller Tristan Strong has won the Coretta Scott King honor. It's been optioned by Disney. Uh, it is, I mean, what can I say? It's, it's West African mythology, African-American mythology mixed together in the modern day, the most sympathetic character you can ever possibly want to meet, and Gum Baby. Wow. Gum Baby alone is worth the price of admission. We have Rebecca Rowanhorse's Race to the Sun, which is about Diné, also called uh, Navajo Sacred Stories. And it is amazing. It's been optioned by Netflix. We also have Taylor K. Mejia's Paula Santiago series, The River of Tears, a retelling of the La Llorona uh, folktale from uh, Mexico, something that, as a Texas boy, I grew up with when I was a kid. Scary stuff. Uh, but it's not just a horror story. It's also a lot more than that. It's fantastic. And in fact, great news for Tristan Strong fans. This week, as of October 6, Tristan Strong Destroys the World is out. This has been getting so much buzz, just like the first book. So many starter reviews. So many fans have been waiting for this. And I can tell you, the sequel does not disappoint. Kwame Mbalia has knocked it out of the park again. Coming in January of 21, I am so excited about this City of the Plague God by Sarwat Chada. I have been a fan of Sarwat's for years, ever since his Ash Mystery series. He is such a great writer. He really gets that mix of humor and action that you have to have for these middle grade books. And this is his take on Mesopotamian mythology, quite possibly the coolest mythology ever. Ishtar and the gods of, of Sumer and Babylon. Oh, my, my gosh, it's, it's fantastic stuff. Now, it also features the first Muslim-American protagonist that we've had in the Riordan Presents imprint, and that is really exciting and really important. City of the Plague God, now that may sound like an interesting title to you, given what the world has been dealing with for the last year with COVID-19. When this was written and when it was titled and when we did the cover and we announced everything, this was before anyone had really heard of COVID-19. We had no idea that we were going to be living through basically a modern version of the plague. We thought about that after, you know, obviously the world changed and we said, hmm, I mean, is this still okay to, to do a book about this? But we thought about it and said, you know, I mean, it's kind of more relevant than ever. I mean, what this tells us is people have been dealing with plagues and figuring out how to cope around pandemics as long as there have been people for thousands of years. And really, the Mesopotamians knew all about this because they had a god of plagues. So, in a way, this is a really cool way to look at how much has changed since ancient times and how much hasn't changed. And Sarwat does a fantastic job bringing mythology and making it very, very relevant to what we're all dealing with these days. Also on the horizon, I think this has to be my favorite Arusha cover yet. Arusha in the City of Gold. Isn't that awesome? I love it. It's coming out April 6th. Rosh has done such a great job. She, she was the first author that we published under the imprint, and she really set a very high standard for the books that came after. A standard, I think, that all of the other authors have also met, and just they've all been fantastic, but she was really our trailblazer. Arusha in the City of Gold coming April 6th, I personally cannot wait. Oh my gosh, this book. Gracie Kim, who lives in New Zealand, I, I don't know how she pulled this off, but she has written a book about Korean witches, clans of Korean witches that live in modern-day Los Angeles. 
the last fallen star. I'm not even sure how to describe it other than to say it is, it's so original that I read it and I said, why has, why has no one thought of this before? This is such a cool idea. The characters are so grounded and so real and so sympathetic. The magic is fantastic. It pulls you right in. And did I mention the food? Oh, whoa, I really want to go to some of these Korean restaurants that the characters visit in LA. I hope some of them at least actually exist because this book will make you so hungry. Ah, and Paolo Santiago is going to be back with the sequel, Forest of Nightmares. Oh my gosh, I can't wait. Taylor is just amazing. Um, she she's just nails this character. Paola is just like you want to be Paola's friend. She's just such a great character, and I cannot wait to see what adventure she's getting into in the Forest of Nightmares. And coming September 7th, this is a pretty special book, too. Pahua and the Soul Stealer by Lori M. Lee. This one is based on Hmong mythology, which I have to admit, I, I really don't know much about and didn't know anything in, until I was introduced to this book. The main character here can see spirits, and she has to find a way to save her brother, who has been taken by mythological forces. It's a great adventure about a mythology that, if you're like me, you may have never really heard of before, but is so rich and so full. Plus, the book has a talking cat. So really, I'm already sold right there. And this, let me tell you, we're doing our first Rick Riordan Presents Anthology of Stories. It's coming out next year, September 28th, and the writers of the imprint have volunteered to write stories about heroes. That's, that's the theme. So each person is writing a new story that will be part of this. So if you like these authors, but you haven't read enough of them, here under one book, you'll get to read all of them. And I will be contributing a story, too, that is my very first look at how I'm tackling Irish mythology. What's it about? Oh, you'll have to wait and see, but I hope you enjoy it. It's really something different and something new for me, and I had a ton of fun writing the story.